I just want you to know that if we fight, the match will be to the death. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 440. And today, I'm talking with Professor George Dillman. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host on this show, the founder at Whistlekick. And you can see everything that I and the rest of the staff work on at whistlekick.com. From the products in the store, which if you use the code PODCAST15, that'll get you 15% off, to whistlekickmarshartsradio.com, where you can find show notes, including photos and links and all kinds of other stuff. Transcripts. We've got a lot going on, and you should stay up on it, because you are most likely a traditional martial artist, and that is what Whistlekick is about. We are about the traditional martial arts and supporting you in whatever is important to you about your training and your martial arts lifestyle. My guest today has been involved in the martial arts for quite a long time. He's been on magazine covers all over the internet, and I suspect quite a few of you know his name. But you probably don't know all the stories that he's going to tell today. So let's listen and hear more. Professor Dillman, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I'm glad to be here. This is uh, I'm George Dillman, and I hail from Reading, Pennsylvania. Thanks for being here. And you haven't always been in Pennsylvania, have you? Mostly. In the military, yeah. I was uh, moved all over. I lived in Washington, D.C. for a whole bunch of years because I was in the military police and stationed there for trouble that took place. And then. Uh, I moved up to New Cumberland. Well, that's back in Pennsylvania. But yes, I went, went back to Pennsylvania. I did my basic training and military schooling at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And then it was back to Pennsylvania. What is it that, that drew you back? I've spent some time in Pennsylvania, and there are aspects of it, that, you know, of, of course, being out in the country that remind me a bit of where I'm from in northern New England. You know, certainly the climate's a little bit different. The geography is a little different, but the people seem very similar. Yeah, no, I've been up your way quite often. I almost bought a uh, a property up in Vermont. It was a really nice twenty five acre farmette for sale, and I was actually I overslept and missed buying it by one hour. <laughs> Do you remember where that was? Yeah, up near uh, White River Junction. Yeah, about 30 minutes from where I am. Yeah, oh, that, that was gorgeous. I, I got to uh, meet Charles Bronson, and he had a big farm up there, 750 acres, I believe. Ranch, he called it. And uh, I went to his, I got invited to his house for dinner, and I, we did that. And I met him at a, a little country restaurant called Skunk Hollow. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we met, got introduced, and we he invited me out to the ranch the next day, and I went, and, and the rest is history. Yeah, <laughs> but I camped that up been... that way a lot. I had a motorhome. Oh yeah, okay. And I camped all over Vermont, New Hampshire, all over New England. But I loved Vermont. I loved the mountains. I loved uh, the river there, the Big White Junction, and all that. And boy, I had a good time up there, many a time, many a time, and I had, and I still have school connections up there. Right. We were we were talking a little bit about that, about one of one of your people who's who's been on the show and has become a good friend. Okay. Let's rewind time. Let's go all the way back. All the way and, back. And all the way back. I was maybe not all, quite baby all the way. Crying, back. and they wouldn't give me the bottle. All right, we, we went a little too far. We got to fast forward a little bit now. Oh yeah, you got a good day. <laughs> Uh, let's, let's fast forward to, to your first introductions to martial arts. How, how well, did that happen? I was uh, nine. I was about nine, nine and a half in that range. And, uh, they start, I lived in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, very uh, famous area of the coal regions. And, uh, it's the home of Yingling Beer, the oldest brewery in the United States. And uh, that's what it's really famous for, and coal and everything else. But I grew up there, and it was a rough town. And my 
stepfather was in the military for 35 years, and he started working with me on how to how to kick people. And they called it dirty fighting back then, but he said, kick them here, and they won't chase you when you run away. And he's right. And uh, since I was a little kid, I used to go to the movie theater by myself. And uh, basically, they started a judo class at the YMCA in Pottsville. And I joined it, and I was doing judo for for about two, two and a half years. And the instructor moved away out to Pittsburgh or somewhere, and the school, the class closed. And there I was, a little boy with a little gi, and didn't know what to do, but I continued on. and. The same YMCA, I used to go there to to work out. After school, I'd stop in, work out, and then go do what I had to do, homework or whatever. But they started, they had a boxing club called Friends of Boxing, FOB. And I got talked into going in to watch that, and I wound up joining. I wound up liking it, and I wound up wound up accepting fights uh, all over Pennsylvania, Altoona, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Philadelphia, and Reading. And they would have the fights usually in National Guard armories. And actually, we got paid to go to them. So I started boxing and got more and more into it. And I wound up with a really decent record I was pretty pretty strong and my finish record was 27 and three losses and uh, I went in the military I signed up in the military in 1960 and when they got in the military they wanted somebody to defend their particular barracks in a boxing contest and the sergeant talked to me, he said, didn't you box? I said, well, I don't want to fight that guy over there, but I wound up going in representing our barracks and won. And then a guy was filling out an application in my office and, and in the military at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And he said, there's a, uh, he had karate down as a, uh, hobby. And I asked him what it was about. I said, I did some judo and some boxing. What's karate about? And he said, uh, karate can beat uh, anybody. I said, what? He said, yeah, you, you learn to fight anybody. We use our hands and our feet, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I'm a boxer. And I said, I'm pretty good at it with gloves on and I'm a little more dangerous without the gloves because I'm going to bare fist you. And he said, if you don't mind, I was higher ranked than him, but he said, if you don't mind, sir, he says, stand up and show me what you do. Throw a, throw a jab, do something. So I went to do it and he kicked me. And I said, wow. I said, where'd you learn that? And uh, he said, up at the, uh, the local gym there in the uh, military base. Classes Tuesday and Thursday. I said, oh, and I think that was a Monday because I said, I'll be there tomorrow night. And I was, and I never looked back. And when I got transferred out of there, I went to New Cumberland Army Depot near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I get there, and there's an article in the paper about a karate guy named Harry G. Smith, come back from the Marines and opened a school and blah, blah, blah. And I called the number, and I went and joined Harry. And he became my main, main permanent instructor. He still is my best friend to this day. Even though people have said we've feuded on the Internet, and there's never been a feud. And he wrote the one person a letter and said, we've never feuded. 
I love George Stillman, and the guy still refused to take that off the internet. But anyway, that's the way the internet goes. <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, I trained with Harry, and he was tough. He was tough. We had to talk him into doing less of the uh, the knuckle push-ups and the crazy stuff he was doing because of the Marines. Because he, he had 100 people sign up for the class, and after about two workouts, he was down to 50. And I we talked to him and said, you got to stop that. He did. He slowed it down to some, but still had one of the hardest workouts around. And I continued with his method for years until uh, I went to officer school and got a commissioned officer sent to D.C., Washington, D.C., and at that time, I met Daniel, Daniel K. Pye, who was teaching in Virginia. And Daniel K. Pye was a martial artist. Very good, very good, actually. One of the best. And uh, I said, would you take me as a student? Can I train with you? He said, no. I'm not taking new students. I waited a week, called him back. I said, did you reconsider taking new students? He says, no, I don't want students. I have a big school. I have a lot of students. So I called him one more time. He said, are you going to be a, at uh, Richard Kim's karate tournament next weekend? I said, yeah. Are you going to compete? I said, yes. He said, uh, talk to me before you do. I want to talk to you, meet you, and I'll watch you. And after the event was over, he said, we're going to train. Then I started training with him, and he became a really good, loyal friend to the day he passed on. And that's about it. I went to Reading, Pennsylvania. Part of the, I went to D.C. went to D.C. for the riots. I was sent in the military police. Actually, I was on orders to go to Vietnam. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I was in the military for 12 years, and I'm a Vietnam veteran, it says. But I, I never felt like that. Because, number one, nobody was welcome home. You went around and you didn't tell people. But that's over now. And uh, I was on orders to go to Vietnam, and they canceled the orders and sent the military police to D.C. because of the riots, and the hippies were going to attack the Pentagon. And I was in the front row of that as an officer, uh, giving commands to a whole my group in front, and we were protecting the Pentagon. And... Uh, and I wound up in race riots. Martin Luther King got shot. I was there. I was there when Martin Luther King made his speech, the second one, not the first one, the one at the Lincoln Memorial. I was one of the officers up front. I got to watch him personally make that. I have a dream speech. And he. Uh, I was in charge of the military police that were lined around the whole uh, lake there, the water mirror and uh i was in charge of my group and we were protecting him and then later he got shot you know that then the riots happened and back in the streets and that's what that was and the whole time i was studying with danny Poy and competing in a lot of tournaments and he would watch me and correct me and eventually, I started uh, winning more. By 1969 through 72, Official Karate Magazine called me the winningest karate person alive in the United States. And I won 327 trophies, and I won them in every area of karate, breaking, uh, there's a big write-up in one of the magazines called George Dillman, the Silent Champion. And when he entered breaking competition, that was me. He won 100% of the time. I never lost. 
weapons. Uh, 80% of the time I won. And uh, kata, I won 75, 80% it said. And fighting, I was about 60% of wins. Fighting was harder than than the kata, naturally. But because back then, tournaments weren't like they were today. Back then, there could have been 700 to 1,000 black belts in a division. And you had to fight all day. And, and when they get down to the final four, you had to then fight off for trophies. So it was very, very difficult. But I did it. I have a bunch of fighting trophies. And uh, I finished my career in 72 in Miami at the big international meet with, uh, I think, Gojuru ran it, but it was people from all over the world, Germany, France, all over, U.S. And there were 5,000 people there competing. And that was my biggest win ever, and I decided I got to retire on that one because I'm getting a lot of attention. And I came home with like seven trophies at that one. I took first place in kata. I took first in weapons. I took first in breaking. I took first in best demonstration. And I took second in in uh, fighting and i only lost a disputed match with big uh big bob foster and uh or is it mike foster big he's a seven foot karate guy down in florida that's really tough fights like a light man i told people like a lightweight but uh I took second to him. The match was one on one to one, and we were both bleeding. And you're not supposed to hit the face. Shigeru Yama was the head referee out of New York. Masaru Yama's brother. He lectured both of us. He said, "I'm supposed to disqualify if there's blood." He said, "But you're both bleeding. I'm going to let the match continue, but the next one that hits." The next one's disqualified. And we sat and and Foster quick got a kick in and won the match, and I was second place. But I got another trophy at that event for winning the most trophies. So I came home with like seven trophies. And they were about ready to carry me out of there on their shoulders. And that's the way it went. And then I just retired at that, which is a good thing because that's when I uh, I traveled to Pittsburgh to train with Hohan Soken. And he told me, Hohan Soken out of Okinawa, 10th degree black belt, highest in the world, most educated person I ever met in the martial arts. He now passed on, but I mean, his knowledge was unbelievable. And he didn't hold back. And he said to me, he's one of the reasons I retired. I got to put it that way, because I trained with him, and I competed at that tournament that they held in his honor and won everything. And even though I wasn't going to compete again, I did there because he was there, and he saw me. He came over, and he said, you do such beautiful kata. That was his words. You do beautiful. Form, a lot of energy, a lot of spirit. Uh, what's this move for? And I, I said, oh, that's blocking a kick. That's blocking this. He said, do you have time tomorrow? I said, for what? He said, I'll give you a four-hour private lesson. I want you to come with me four hours. I want to train you. It hurts me in my heart. For you to do form that well and not know why you're doing them. And I didn't say anything, but I was thinking, I bet you he don't know how many trophies I have. But that was funny. Later with my student, he didn't care about the trophy. 
He cared about injuring people. And that's when we got into the pressure points. And he took me in a room in 1972. He gave me a, a pressure point chart, which I still have. Gave me notes on how to attack them. Gave me another set of notes on what the results would be. And trained me for four hours. And every move I showed him, he had a reason for it to be real self-defense. And he said, uh, there's no block. You don't block in Kata. Why would you block an opponent that's not there? Blocking is done when you have opponent fighting, sparring, kumite, and one step, we would call it, or whatever. He said, you block. But you don't block when you're by yourself. Blocking develops with people develops timing, distance, and coordination. By yourself develops none of that. You could stand there all day long and block to your blue in the face, and somebody's going to hit you, and they're probably going to hit you. You're going to be a little too soon or a little too late with that so-called block. Well, this was all catching me by shock. Needless to say, after four hours, I went out of there depressed. Went back to my dojo, and I thought, oh, geez, I really don't know anything about the martial arts, nothing. And uh, I kept teaching my class, and at that time, because of all my trophy wins, I had the biggest school in the United States. Others started to get bigger and get more students because they gave out ranks or whatever, but I had 400 serious students and was teaching at three colleges in Reading, Pennsylvania. And had big classes there with headlines in the newspapers that, that uh, they're learning this, they're learning that. At Albright College, Kutztown College, and Alvernia College. And then I got asked to go over to Penn State and teach. And then I went up to Penn State main campus to teach. And it just expanded from there. And I, in 1983, went to visit Seiyu Ayata after he moved to the United States. I got invited out there and uh, to Kansas. And I went. Any Anytime somebody, because of my coal regions training, anytime somebody said the word, Fight, I was there. It's that simple. And that's the way my life went. When I moved to Reading, Pennsylvania and opened the dojo, they got 400 people. There's a man that has a school up in New York. I think he's still alive. But he said, nobody can have a, a Japanese man. I can even say his name, but I don't think we will. But he challenged me to a fight to the death. That's serious business. Sent one of his green belts over and gave me a note. Come to my class and I will fight you in front of my students. I just want you to know that if we fight, the match will be to the death. Well, guess what? I showed up. Alone. He's sitting there kneeling, talking to his students, and a couple of them nodded their heads. He's in the back of the room, they said. He's ready, I guess, to fight to the death. <laughs> Their instructor, and this is an honest to God true story, went in the bathroom, climbed out the window, and went home or went somewhere. The class is sitting there and sitting there, and finally somebody went in the bathroom to see if it was okay, and the window was open, and his shoes were gone. And many of those students then came and joined my school when I opened up, and he moved out of Reading. He was embarrassed, shamed, and moved up to New York to open up a dojo. So that's, that's the way it went. And I built a big dojo there, and those 
students, I created top fighters. Billy Blanks came to train with me before he won the world championship. And I'll be honest, he wouldn't have won it without my my help because he made major mistakes back then. I went up to Buffalo, New York, and I wasn't competing, but uh, his instructor, Ting, and it's a funny sounding name, Ting Fong Wong, Chinese man, thought he was setting me up because I don't know if he didn't like me or what, but he says to me, will you do a fighting demonstration with Billy Blanks? And I didn't know Billy Blanks at all. And I didn't know that he won the championship up there seven years in a row. Till later, I found they said, well, he's seven years a champion here. And you're going to fight him? I said, well, yeah. It's a demonstration. Well, it wound up being more than a demonstration. And it got pretty rough, if you know Billy Blanks. And uh, to make a long story short, Billy Blanks, and he'll say it, learned his flying scissors through me. I had never done it at a uh, actual tournament, but I did it in the dojo and all. And we're fighting, and boy, things are getting rough. I leaped up in the air, which I could jump quite high back then. I was young and really in shape. Jumped up in the air, threw a scissors around. Right foot hooked his chest. Left leg went behind his leg. Slept him over backwards, and I hit him in the head. And he was like dizzy, and he got up, shook my hand. He said, what did you do? He said, would you show that to me, sir? And later on, I taught him how to do it. Then he actually perfected it and became known for it. He was doing it all over the world to people. So that's that's my story. And uh, I trained with Seiyu Ayata, and he got seriously into pressure points. That's all he did. Bunkai. Got a breakdown. Uh, I'm going to brag, but nobody has better caught a breakdown than I. And Sayu Ayata at the time, because he got it from the old world school. And he trained with the man that was uh, one of the last samurai, if you read his story. And uh, he said to me the same thing Hohan Soken said. To, well, he threw something in. He says, football players practice football all week. I said, going to play football. He said, they don't stand around blocking nothing. Even when they do block it, it's against bags and, and the big machines, they block and push. He said, they don't block nothing. Why would you block in a kata with no opponent? I didn't tell him I heard that from home on something, but that's what he said. I go, yeah, that's that's true. Why would you do that stupid stuff? So uh, I got an education, and then he started breaking down what a block is used for. And it's pressure point manipulation. If it ain't manipulation, it, it's the attack or it sets up the attack. And so anytime your hand moves, even when your hand's on your hip, you're to have your opponent's wrist at your hip while you're doing something with the other hand to a corresponding pressure point that'll take him out. And that was the start of my serious. Went back and changed my school. At that time, I had a, a following of 25 dojos. And I had a hard time explaining to them that for all these years, I've been training them wrong. That you've been training in sport. Now we're going to get, and they laugh because they know I'm always funny and making jokes. And they said, uh, if uh, that is a block, what is it? I called all my instructors to meet me in Virginia. Some of them are now down doing their own seminars, but they met me in. And down in Virginia, we had an instructor-only meeting. 
and 25 to 30 showed up. And I started telling them what it was. I started with ho hum soaking. I went into a yacht. I said, this is not a block. Doesn't this make more sense? And if you do it in your mind as a block, you'll never use it. How many goofy blocks are in there that people won't use? They, well, I wouldn't use that in a real block. Well, then why are you practicing it? That's what Oyata said. Football team doesn't practice uh, blocking against the air. They practice football all week. Martial artists, he said, should practice fighting all week. Hand to hand, somebody in your hand. Grab them, hit them, hit them here, hit them there. There's 361 pressure points all over the human body. I told people, they asked me about it. They said, have you ever been hit in the solar plex and lost your air, doubled over? They go, well, yeah. I can do that at 361 places. And I paid attention and got real good at it, which Matt Brown will tell you. I'm real good at it. And uh, now I'm not going to brag or but it is a little bit, but I'm going to be 77 years old this year. I'm in good shape, move well, have good flexibility. The doctor can't believe my flexibility. But the physical therapist, he said, when I get your leg up here or your arm up here, he said, let me know if it hurts. Well, it didn't hurt. He kept going. He said, I'm not going any further. <laughs> and so that's that story. But. Uh, when I was 75, a year and a half ago, a man actually came up to me at a local place in Reading, Pennsylvania, and said, well, you're older now. I can beat you up. I said, no, I don't think you can. And he was lifting weights, obvious, built like Parson. And I said, no, I said, it hasn't changed. You still can't. Well, but I can. And I said, look, I said, I do pressure points now. And I said, it's way different. Well, he walked away and was steaming, drinking some of that alchemy hall. And, he, and I'm with my wife and her brother. He comes back up a good half hour later and confronts me against the wall and says, I was serious I can beat you up. Well, guess what? I knocked his ass out, sat him down, and left him sit there for half an hour in the bar. He had the biggest headache, I can guarantee. I don't know, but he had the biggest headache in the damn world. And his family came and got him and let him out of there. So said, what happened? And that's all I know, and they left. And I haven't seen him since, but that's what happened. So I don't mess around when it comes to that. And I'm good at pressure points all over the place, arms, legs. I've been challenged for serious five times in seminars. It's in my book. I have a book called Prometheus on Amazon. That's my life story, George Stillman's life story. Almost everything I'm telling you now is in that book. And it gets deep, and there's things to be learned in that book. Most of the people that want to talk about this don't work and that don't work haven't read my book, haven't even looked at it, haven't watched one of my DVDs. I have 50 DVDs trying to teach people how to do a better martial art. And uh, they don't do it. But Prometheus is my life story, and there's quotes in there. I had five challenges. I had a man in Australia. I knocked him out one year. I go back to Australia. He opens up his big mouth with 190 people in the room and says, uh, well, yeah, you knocked me out on the neck. Anybody can. Now, I didn't even start the seminar yet. And he said, you knocked me out on the neck last time. And he said, I'm a kickboxer. That blah, blah, blah. Anybody can knock anybody out on the neck. And as he was saying that, I was walking towards him. Because I didn't like him anyway with his attitude there. And I said, I beg your pardon. And he repeated it. 
I was right in front of him. And I said, I can do it all over the place. And I spearhanded him in both ribs on what we call liver points. And he dropped to the ground just about throwing up. Fell on his hands and knees like a dog. And I left him there. I said, now we're going to start the seminar. Everybody went, yes, sir. And that's how that happened. I had another one in New Zealand. This made the magazines over there. People think this is all jokes. This ain't jokes. The top Thai boxer in, in uh, Thailand, number two out of New Zealand, Thai boxer, challenged me in the magazine. He said, I'm going to Dillman's seminar. If he doesn't knock me out, I'm knocking him out. Well, this drew my biggest seminar yet, New Zealand. In fact, in New Zealand, I had eight, over 800 people at my seminars in New Zealand. It's a little country, two little islands. But anyway, I'm starting the seminar, and he shows up. And they said, he's at the door, and he refuses to pay. I said, well, I ain't worried about that. I said, let him in. Let the bull in the ring. And I said, listen up, everybody. You're going to get a show here in a minute. Terry Hill is here. That was his name. And uh, he challenged me openly in the magazine, and I'm, I'm here accepting. And he comes into the room like a damn bull. I said, Terry, how are you doing? He says, fine. I knocked him out. I didn't wait for the fight. I think he thought we were going to get in stances and positions. I knocked him out, just left him lay there. And I went teaching the seminar, and you could have heard a pin drop in that room. Because that ended that one. I had one in Arkansas, very similar. I ain't going to go into all of them. They're in my book. They're in the book of my life. And uh, pressure points are deep. People go, I don't believe it. Well, then don't do it. You know, people... Write me letters, even. I don't believe in what you do. I don't believe. Well, then don't do it. It's, it's you know, if I want to do it, it's uh, even like the presidential races. I don't like this guy. I like that guy. I don't like that. Well, good. Don't vote for him. But why do you care who I vote? And with pressure points, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. I have hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Go to my website, Dillman.com. Contact any one of those schools. They're in countries all over the world, from Germany to Spain to France, and ask them, is this for real? And they'll say, yeah, come to my, uh, my dojo. I'll help you with it. And they won't go because they know they'll be an uki. But uh, I have hundreds of thousands of people that do it. I have probably hundreds, thousands more that say they're doing it, aren't really good at it, I guess. I don't know, because I've sold a lot of DVDs and books, and that's what bothers people, I guess, because I made a lot of money doing what I, in this category. But I sold, uh, I think it's 450,000 books so far, and still selling. Amazon.com is pounding them out like you wouldn't believe because of my latest coverage in Black Belt Magazine. I have a story in Black Belt Magazine right now, October, November issue, 2019, saying George Dillman changed the world. Changed the world in the martial arts. Whether you like it or not, it says these are major changes. And Leo Fong said there's uh, only a handful of people that made major changes in the world. And George Stillman is one of them. It's on the back of my Prometheus book, his quote. So uh, have you seen the Black Belt magazine yourself? I have. It's a nice spread. Yeah. Leo Fong said there's five pioneers who shaped the 20th century world of martial arts. Jiro Kano in judo, Gishu Funakoshi in karate, 
Moriu Sheba, I guess it's Keto, Bruce Lee, and George Delman. That's from 91-year-old Grandmaster Leo Fong, who's been doing the martial arts forever. That's quite a statement. What a statement. Proud of that statement, actually. And I love Leo. I've been friends with Leo for almost 50 years. And you know how I met Leo? How? Through Bruce Lee. Tell us Back about that. when I was doing the martial arts, there were very few schools. Today, they're afraid to take their students to seminars. They're even afraid to take them to tournaments. Because somebody's able to see how bad their students are or whatever. They're afraid to go out there. They're afraid to lose students. Oh, if I take them to a Matt Brown's seminar and he teaches a lot of good stuff, my student will quit and want to join Matt Brown. So they won't go. A lot of that going on because of commercialism. Back when I was in uh, starting out, let's give it back to 1959, 1960, 61. There were only a handful of schools in the whole country. Everybody knew who everybody was. Everybody knew Harry Smith out of Pennsylvania. Everybody knew Ed Parker was in California. Trios was in Arizona. They were, they were all over the place. And uh, you knew who they were. And they didn't care about sharing and comparing. And they would recommend them, hey, if you're in California, see if you can get in and train with Ed Parker. <laughs> or go up to see Leo Fong or Wally J. And when I was with Bruce Lee, I like the Dane drop. That nobody has the bigger one than Bruce. But he was a good guy. I really liked Bruce. But Bruce Lee told me, he said, if you get to California, he said, the main guys to study with, and he said, I respect them like you wouldn't believe, is Professor Wally J. And keep in mind, I hadn't met Wally. And Leo Fong. And he said, Ed Parker's big and tough, but Ed Parker has size going for him, size and weight. But he said, Wally J and Leo Fong are the real deal. I said, really? He said, yeah. Now, this is from Bruce Lee. He said, if you ask them a question, they don't tell you the answer. They get you up on the mat and do the answer. I said, oh, so I kept that in my mind that I had to meet those two. And then Bruce died unexpectedly. And when he died, I was actually heartbroken, depressed, really. I was down in the dumps for a while because everybody's talking about him. But boy, I was missing, missing a friend and young, real young. It woke you up to life and death. If he's gone. And Wally J was going to teach up in Canada a seminar over near the middle of Canada. And I said, do any of my students want to go? And they said, yeah, we'll go with you. I had about nine, 12, I forget. But we hopped in my motor home. And we shuffled off to Canada to train with Wally J. Loved the experience. And I said to Wally, can I get you at my dojo to teach? Yeah. I said, how much? He gave me a price. He said, I need my airfare. I said, I understand that. You're in California. And I said, I want you to come up my dojo and meet my people and train. And he gave me his business card. I go back home and talk to everybody, and they said, oh, man, that'd be great. I said, this is a guy, Bruce Lee was dead at the time. I said, this is a guy Bruce Lee respected and loved. Wally Jay used to come home from work. He worked at the post office, actually, for years. And he came home from work, and as his story goes, 
Bruce Lee was sitting on his front doorstep waiting to trade. And not many people can say that. And Wally J came and talked to my people and did seminar. And we hooked up and became the best of friends. And then I went to meet Remy Priestos, who did not get recommended by Bruce Lee. didn't even know him, but I met Remy Priestos, a stick Arnis person that's probably one of the best in the world. He's dead now, but he was he was a tough boy. And Wally J, Remy Priestos, and myself agreed to do seminars together and share. And we did three-day camps all over the world for almost, oh, almost 20 years, 18 years for sure. And then Remy had to go to the hospital, and he wound up with a uh, brain tumor, and he died. But And then Wally and I did some things after that. But for 18 years, it was the three of us, known as the big three. And you name a country, and we were probably there teaching. And the crowd showed up by the hundreds. Houston, Texas, we had 380. Black Belt Magazine covered it back then with a 10-page, and they don't give 10 pages too much, a 10-page feature story on how lucky the people were to be able to come train with the three greatest people in the world in one shot. And there were so many showed up. And then we had a kids that day, with the, that's not with the children. We had a children's seminar, train mini camp, Friday night for kids, Saturday, Sunday adults. So we had 380 adults. We had over 120 children. And we had talked to the hotel, and they gave us two more ballrooms. And we divided the, the people, a hundred, about roughly 120 in each room. And they didn't have to go from room to room. We went from room to room. And they got a full session with each one of us for the weekend. And naturally, that was very lucrative and successful. And a lot of people are jealous of that stuff. It's just simple. Uh, a man that's very high in the government. He's a lawyer. He's the one that wrote my book, Prometheus. Said, uh, you got him on how you're living. That's what they're jealous of. And uh, that's it. Do you have any questions of me? <laughs> I've got all kinds of questions, sir. Well, wow. I I was I was enjoying story time, and and anybody that's listened to the show before knows that that's that's how I do it. I just like to let the guests go, and right, you know, we we often get into some things that may be a little different than you know if I'm driving the conversation, but to flip it around and let you drive. Now you've brought up a couple times, and and certainly anyone who knows who you are knows that you are. No, no stranger to this controversy around pressure points, and, and you you addressed it. And you know, my my job here, I don't, you know, I I, I am complete, as as objective as I can be. You know, when I speak with a guest, I no, I, don't I got take you, I got sides, you. I take no stance on anything because you know what, I enjoy hearing stories, and stories right. are stories are entertaining whether they are true or not, and that's that's well, no matter um, true. Well, I. I, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I am 100% not passing any judgment. Yeah. Sir, but I wanted to talk about, go ahead. I, I wanted, I want to talk about the criticism. Yeah, go ahead. And I wanted to, yes. hammer it. Uh, well, I, I wanted, I want to look at it from a, from a different angle. Go ahead. Because people come at, you know, controversy tends to be this happened or this didn't happen. This is real or not real, true or not true. And what I'm more interested about, because you talked about, how some of this started decades ago. How did that, how did knowing that other people were somewhere between skeptical and outright blatantly disagreeing with what you were teaching, how did that shape your future training and the way you taught? Not at all. I marched forward, number one, 
And you got to remember, most of my training was before iPhones and internet. That's the problem. Nobody cared who did what before they got a laptop or before their students got a laptop and, and went and looked at one of my DVDs. I just put my first DVD, which I recorded in 1983, I put it, in fact, actually, Matt Brown helped me put it on YouTube. And that's going to stir controversy because it goes back to what Hohan Silken and Sayu Oyata said. You know, this ain't a block. But anyway, before the laptop, you either went to a seminar or you just kept doing what you were doing. The problem today is laptops and phones. They pass it around right away. Selling books and items is difficult because they get something online and they they pass it on to everybody in their organization or whatever, and nobody's buying it anymore. So it was the little, what I'm saying, it was the little, like your grandpa told you, it was better in the past. (laughs) Popcorn was only five cents when you went to the movie. But it's changed, and now the only people, what do they call them, keyboard warriors, they sit there. None of them have been to a seminar. I haven't had people. I'll fight you. I'll give you $10,000 to fight me. Well, number one, they usually don't have the $10,000. I'd like to politely tell. In fact, I have told some that. When you get to 10000 let me know. And they don't have it, number one. Number two, they want to fight. And I said, where, where are you from? Well, then that's the end of those emails. They don't want to say. Or one, one goes, I'm, I actually one, one time said I'm from Detroit. And I said, okay, look at my calendar. I'm doing a, a seminar in Detroit in two months. I'll tell you what, you can be my guest. Well, you can almost hear them uh, blow wind over the phone. Pardon the expression, but it's called fart. <laughs> but they do. They, they. Oh, I'm going to be there. Why, why couldn't you make it? Oh, you ought to hear that. I was there. Where were you? Uh, well, my wife had to take the baby shopping, and we had to go. Yeah, okay. I had one up in. Uh, Idaho, I was trying to think of where it was. And a man from Spokane, Washington. Give me grief every time I go up. He doesn't know anything. Well, how do you know? You haven't been to a seminar. You haven't read a book. You haven't read a DVD. Where are you coming up with this information? And I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in, in Boise, Idaho. Nampa. Nampa, Idaho. And I said, you're close enough. I asked the guy there, how far is that? A couple hour drive, I said. Well, I'm going to be there. Come on over. I ain't paying for a seminar, he told that guy. And I said, tell him he's free. And he actually sent an email. It's honest to God, true story. And, And a man named Kevin Hutchinson can back it up. But he said, uh, George Stillman can't, can't, what did he say, walk and chew gum at the same time. And he, man put in a seminar, sent me that email. I sent that man an email, a letter, a letter, written letter, put it in the post office. And I sent him a stick of gum. And I said, this is your payment to come into the seminar. I said, just come to the front desk, sign in, and when they want paid, hand them a stick of gum, and you're in. Well, he had 52 reasons why he couldn't come there. And then we've never heard from him since. And 
a lot of people in my organization get the same grief. Chris Thomas, they all hear about it. Matt Brown, well, he can bother them. They all hear about it. And they're out teaching seminars, and they go, it's funny nobody shows up. They all talk about it. That's all they ever saw. And I think it was Wally J called them keyboard warriors. And Wally J was, his common expression was, the proof is on the mat. Not verbal, on the mat. Not Matt Brown, M A T Matt. <laughs> right. And he said, Come on, let's be there and get on the mat together. Well, they don't show up. That was all the way back with Wally J before computers. And that was his biggest statement. The proof is on the mat. And as I told you, Bruce Lee said to me, Wally J gets you on the mat. You have a question, you better be ready to get it done on you. And I said, well, really? And I told you the rest of the story. Right. So that's what it is. But a lot of the problem is computers. I've had people give me grief way back. Uh, because I'm teaching something their instructor don't know. And their instructors have lied to them. Their instructors have told them, well, he's teaching higher rank stuff right off the bat. Oh, uh, I know that. I was going to teach you that one day. And then we always add, yes, when you learn it. Because they don't know it. <clears throat> and they're afraid to say they don't know anything. And I don't care how tough you think you are. Everybody's heard the story, especially in boxing and in football. Any team can beat any other team any given day. It just depends on the on the day and the uh, who's sick and who's feeling good and who's not feeling good. And I wake up some days, I feel like they beat up the world. And you go out and you go, boy, I hope somebody picks on me. But other days you have a cold, you're down to dump, low energy, you go, no, oh, I hope nobody picks on me. <laughs> but anyway, it's a joke. But that's what's going on. Is the computers ruin every damn thing, including people's lives. I go in major restaurants with my wife, and I, I will tell her, I used to do it too. I was guilty. And we stopped it. It took, I got off Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. And it took me two or three weeks to wean myself off it. And I found out I was answering questions to the same goofy people all the time. I said, goofy people, here comes my hate list. But they get on Facebook and they pass things around. Or they read something out of my book and then they put it out to the world. And you can't stop it. I go major restaurants. You've seen it. I've seen it. Everybody's looking down at their phone. I said something years ago to my grandson. Actually, to his mother. We're out to a big dinner, and the kid's sitting next to me, and his phone's going ding, 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 ding. And he's not looking up. He's not in the conversation. He's looking down. I, I said, hey, you know, I said, eat your meal, enjoy it. I'm have the family here so we can talk. No, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Meantime, he's looking down, telling everybody what a great time he's having. You've seen it, I'm sure. Thank you, my guilty. I was guilty for the longest while. Or something similar. Always oh, on a damn phone. Last night, we almost got hit. My wife, a boy, she was driving. We're going in town. And, and a guy came right over the yellow line by, by several feet. And he's looking down texting. And she had to go off the road to the right to 
keep from getting hit. So you have to drive defensive because that's a lot of that going on. You know it and I know it. There's accidents. There's deaths because of it. So this damn phone is a problem and the laptop's a problem. It's now and now Kindle. They can get it right on Kindle and show you. My books are all on Kindle. People are reading them. Well, people take some excerpts and put them on their website as if they're theirs. One or two people out there teaching seminars using uh, half the stuff out of my book. So that's the way life goes. I talked to the editor of Black Belt Magazine. By the way, nobody goes to my website, Dillman.com, and goes back to to uh, my letters of approval. And years ago, I don't know if you've seen it, the editorial in Black Belt Magazine. The editorial, I put it right on my website, the full page. Now, this is people I don't know. But they, they said, for once, Dillman let his art to his talking, and he came in Black Belt Magazine and knocked everyone out on the staff. Now, they said that, and yet people didn't believe that, or they didn't see it, I don't know, but they didn't believe that. The editor just made that up. I went and knocked out the publisher, the editor, every one of them. And he said the only one he didn't knock out was the receptionist because she was 87 or something. And he, she said, I don't want it. I don't want it. And that's in there. That's in that editorial. Back in 1980, when I was on the cover of their biggest selling magazine in the world, my my red cover of Black Belt Magazine, 1980, was the, the best seller they ever had. You can't even buy a copy from them anymore. They sold out of all their copies. They keep on file. It's sold out everywhere. And when it goes on the eBay, it's gone right away. So that's what's happening. That's what's happening, sports fans. And if you don't believe it, don't do it. Don't tell me it don't work till you've been there. Let's unpack that for a moment, this idea that if you don't believe it, don't don't do it. Because I think that, as as you mentioned, keyboard warriors, there are people out there who get so wrapped around the axle on their own beliefs, whether it's politics or martial arts or you got it. nutrition or anything, that some there's something in in them and the way that they look at the world that says if if they can't convince you that you are wrong somehow they're they're failing or the world's crumbling around them or something because it, it would be easier wouldn't it on everyone if hey you don't believe well, that this here, works here's, just don't here's go what i run into please over 80 percent of the world of the world believes in acupuncture 80% of the whole world knows it works. It does work. They believe in pressure points. They believe it works. Why can't they believe this works? Then their first excuse is pressure points are too little. You can't hit them. Do you want to bet? Besides, a lot of the movies in cut, I got to touch you or grab you. And if you're close enough to hit me, I'm close enough to grab you. And I'm going to grab you on a spot that's going to put you down on your knees. It's that simple. And my wife is standing here, Suzanne Gilman. We've been married for almost 15 years. But she uh, went to France with me. And they called me from France. This is not martial artists. They wanted me to train uh, the, the uh, firemen, the police. And they took me to the police headquarters where they trained their SWAT team because of the riots. And he called me, he said, we were told we should get you over here to train. And I said, why are you getting, what can you teach, they said. I said, well, I can teach you how to put everybody down and get them off you and handcuff them within a second or two. Really? I said, yeah. What do we have to pay you? I told him. And I'm not cheap, by the way. 
And I said, well, I'll go. And uh, they said, what can you do? We're at the military, at their training school outside of Paris. Didn't know anybody. They didn't even speak English. I said, get me the biggest, strongest guy. That's the, We still laugh about that. The biggest, strongest guy you can have there. And bring him out, and I'm going to put him down and handcuff him within a second. You could do this. I said, I'll tell you what, let's start that way. And if I don't do it, you don't have to pay me. How's that? Okay. So I go over. Now, the joke is, and it ain't a joke, they brought a monster like I've never seen in my life. They brought out some guy who was seven feet tall, and his arms looked like people's legs. And that's a true story. My wife standing right here to back that story up. She was with me in the room. And she even said to me, look at the size of him. And I leaned over. I jokingly said to her, yeah, I hope this stuff works. (laughs) Remember that, Susie? And I said, I hope this works. And that was a joke, but she could this is the guy. Blah, 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 blah. And then somebody translated in France. I said, okay, try to grab me. This big guy grabbed me. I, boom, I grabbed him, knocked him on the arm, hit his pressure point, numbed his whole arm, threw it behind his back, threw him down the ground, grabbed his handcuffs and handcuffed him. He had him on his side. And they were just all amazed. And I said, uh, we're now ready to teach a seminar. And the guy says to me, well, the one guy in France, in French started mumbling. And I don't speak French. But he said, blah, 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 blah. And the guy that translated said, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, the man you handcuffed. You used his handcuffs. I said, yeah. His key to the handcuffs is back in the barry. (laughs) Really? He says, yeah. We have to send somebody to go try to find his key. Now, he's laying on the floor handcuffed, trying to explain to them where his key is. And they run to look for his key. And the whole time he is gone, everybody there is kind of making a out of him, joking, and you know how it would go. Mm. So that's just one story. I just, I love that story because it was like King Kong walked in. It's a good story. But I like that one. Pressure points work. In fact, actually, if you study them, they read, they work better. If your opponent is bigger and stronger than you, that's why I liked it. Most of the people teaching women. One guy is so mad at me now because I corrected him on Facebook what he was teaching women wrong that won't work, teaching a woman's seminar, showing some moves on Facebook that were wrong, won't work. So you'll get the woman killed or beat up or raped. And I said, if she just moves her hand over to here and does it, It'll work better. And one of his people come back to him and said, oh, my God, does that work? And he has to talk to me this day. I think he dropped me as a Facebook friend, don't communicate. And I figure, well, that's the way it goes. A lot of people teaching things out there just, it's wrong. It's that simple. It's just wrong. And I wouldn't have believed that either when I was a national competitor I would not have believed what I'm telling you now. And I would not have believed it was the angle and direction to attack pressure points is hidden within the forms that everybody does in every country. All the forms have their history going back 750 years to Yang Chang Feng, who made the first tata or form known to man that's in books And if you read on his history, he developed the first form in China, mapping out how to attack the bad spots 
of acupuncture, the weak spots. That's history. Mm. I used to read that statement at my seminars, and the people who came to my seminar believed it. But the ones that didn't come to my seminars don't believe it. Naturally, they don't, oh, that couldn't work. Well, good. Yang Chang Feng made it up that it would work. And that's, that's the name of the whole game. Uh, if you don't believe it, don't do it. I have, if you go to my website, I have hundreds of schools. And the schools you see on there have anywhere from 10 to 50 under them. They're just not on my website. They're on their website. So it's here. It's here to stay. Black Bell Magazine said I made major changes to the world. And that's what life's about. There's a lot of people uh, on, on uh, hitting on me with National Geographic visual. On National Geographic, I did it. They wanted it proved. I did it. I did it. I moved people. I knocked people. People are knocked out without touching. One man almost died. I can give you his damn name. He almost died at that filming. And National Geographic came in with a negative attitude because they had just filmed some other things. But that's not the point I want to bring up. The point I'm going to bring up, there's one guy saying, oh, that's a fraud, fraud. The man that they're calling a fraud is out in Chicago, and it's not me. He got on Chicago television and told him, his name is Tom, his first name, but he told him he's George Dillman. Or somehow it got lost because he was going to do the George Dillman theory, but they announced him as George Dillman and they said when he's done, this guy don't know what he's doing. He's a fraud. Well, that wasn't me. That was not me. That was, and I know his name. He's a real douchebag. Am I allowed to say douchebag? <laughs> you sure are. Ooh. Anyway, that's the story. And on National Geographic, Leon J. did not knock out that little tiny man. But remember I told you. Pressure points work better if the guy's bigger and stronger. And uh, in Chicago, they brought in some little tiny guy, and I, I didn't even want to try to knock him out in case it wouldn't work. Little person, littler pressure point. Bigger person, bigger pressure point. This art works if the person is stronger than you, bigger than you. That's when you need it. That's when women need it. Anybody who's going to attack a woman's going to be usually bigger and stronger and hitting her. And, so that's when this art is needed. Most arts don't work if they're stronger than you. And that's one of the first things I used to open up seminars with. I used to grab the biggest guy there and grab the littlest guy and say, now just try to get out of that with what you know, and they couldn't get out of it. I said, now put a finger right here. Press on the radio nerve. Watch what happens. Now touch him here. Oh, my. The guy goes down to his knee. Well, then it works. People teach uh, rubbing uh, beside the nose, putting the knuckle. Beside, I'm going to teach one right now on the air. If you touch, take your middle knuckle and press, take your right hand, press to the left side, and just take your knuckle and press beside the nose. Not on the nose, not under it, just beside that little indent. Right there. He won't go anywhere. Rub under his nose. Everybody knows you rub under the nose. Try that. He feels it, but it doesn't hurt. Now, have the guy grab you. Take your left hand and just touch or place it with a little pressure on top of his, your left hand on top of his right hand that's grabbing you. Where the radial nerve is, just push down. And now take your right hand and rub under his nose and he'll fall on the ground screaming. The harder you rub, the faster he drops. The bigger he is, the faster he drops. Women should know that. I bring that up in, in uh, when I do get to TV. The college girls learned that. Because if a man's going to rape you, 
because he'll probably knock you down, be getting his clothes off, et cetera. I don't need to describe it. But he's going to have a hand on the floor while he takes his right hand or left hand and tries to get his uh, privates out. And while he has his left hand on the floor, all she has to do is touch it and touch his damn nose and he'll fall off her. And I demonstrate that. We do that in, in classes with women all over. Pressure points work. That's my theory. Stick it with it. My mom told me I'll can leave you on an ending here with my mom. But my mom uh, told me uh, when I was gone from first grade to second grade, we had moved from a place called Schuylkill Haven, Pennsylvania, to Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And I was in first grade in Schuylkill Haven, but I was going to second grade in Pottsville. And my mom said, you're new. Nobody's going to know you in that class. And I want you to stay out of trouble. I don't want you to get in a fight. They're going to pick on you or they're going to say something. And I said, okay, mommy. She said, uh, the easiest way, now this is back when I was in second grade because it applies today. She said, number one, if they start talking about religion, do not say a thing. Do not join in. Just Stay out of the conversation about religion, and you won't be in a big argument. Politics, she said that back then. If they bring up politics, she said, first of all, they're in second grade. They don't know who they want for this president or whatever. They're, they've only listened to their parents at the breakfast table. And that's their opinion. But she, she told me that. She said, do not discuss politics. Do not discuss religion. And you won't be in any fights. And she was right. She was right. And it's today. Same thing. Don't discuss religion. Don't discuss politics. And you'll stay out of trouble. You need me to mail you a stick of gum. That's you. <laughs> oh, you're actually at no, no, certainly not, sir. <laughs> oh, shit. Hey. Do you live in Vermont? I do. Well, I'm jealous. Except in the winter. In the winter, I'm not jealous. Yeah, we have about nine months of winter. Well, I know that. <laughs> Maybe not quite, but yeah, it gets cold. I went to it's Alaska cold. and I was up in Alaska. And, uh, the guy said, the first thing he said, he said, uh, do you, you have four seasons? He said, yeah. He said, we have four seasons, just like you do. I said, do you do? He said, yeah, we have winter. We have June, July, and August. <laughs> and June is spring, July is summer, and August is fall, and they're back at winter. And that's the way it is, for real. Yeah. He said, we have four yeah, seasons. Maybe you could use that about for but we have four seasons. Well, the, the joke Winter. I've heard, uh, the joke I've heard told that I that I enjoy. I don't know if I've shared this on the show, but I'll, I'll say it. People ask, you know, what do you do in Vermont in the summer? And we will often respond, we usually take that week off from working. Oh yeah, oh god, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. I used to camp at a campground. Used to canoe that river, and uh, it was down from uh, White River Junction, and there was a state-run campground on the river. Mm -hmm. And I used to camp there all the time. Boy, I loved it. And I don't know if Vermont, if White River Junction looks the same or not, but they, when you went into town, they had a little old country store right there. And changed he, a little bit. White yeah. River hasn't changed a, a ton. He used to have big blocks of cheese out and sweat coming off them, and you'd cut one mm -hmm. 
size T she won. Oh my God, was that good? That's where I met Charles Bronson. Okay. Because he was in there, he, he needed food. Yeah. Everybody needs food, no matter where you are. And uh, the man that owns, owned the place then, he's probably dead, was named Hoos. was his nickname. And he and I became friends because I was camping so many times there. And I ran up to Hoos's to buy whatever I needed for camp. And hot dogs and whatever to cook on the grill and marshmallows over the fire or whatever. And uh, Hoos said, hey, I want you to meet somebody. And it was Charles Bronson. He says, Charlie, come here, because they were friends. And he introduced me, and that's how I met him. Hmm. So that's that story. I got to say one that's thing true. with the martial arts. Please. I've been very, very fortunate. To, and I don't want to say I'm lucky because one man that was, well, wealthier than me, but wealthy, uh, said, it seems people say you're lucky because you're living like that. And he said, my answer is, it seems the longer and harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. You got that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that, was, said by, that was said by a local man right around here. I'm, I'm out in Ohio right now. And uh, I'm on the beach of Lake Erie. And I have a beautiful beautiful view of three islands, boats coming and going. And I, I absolutely love it here. I've been coming here 40 years. But one thing that the martial arts has done for me that I, I don't know, I, I owe it. Uh, it's had me travel all over the world. 30, 30 some countries. Australia, five times. New Zealand, five times. Japan, three times. China, went into China. Matt Brown will live with it, China. It went coast to coast in China. We went out to see the panda bears in the wild. We went down to see the terracotta warriors. Got a book autographed by the man that found the terracotta warriors. And I've literally been all over the world, all over Europe. And I, I got to say, and I can say this, but people can't duplicate a lot of it. It didn't cost me any money. I got paid to do it for teaching seminars. They'd bring me into Australia. And a lot of times, I didn't care if I had a profit. I'd spend whatever they were paying me seeing their country. I literally did the entire coast of Australia, top to bottom, all the way down to the bottom and watched penguins come in, down near the uh, Antarctic, in Finland. Finland, I went 180 miles north of the Arctic Circle and ran dog sleds. There's pictures in my life story. Ran a dog sled. Nobody's done that, that I know. They've done it, but not that I know. And I've been all over the world. And I come back usually with more money than I left with. And I don't say anything because I'll talk to people and they go, I went to Australia for a vacation and I took my wife and we loved it. It cost me $5,000. And I, and I don't tell them, oh, I went to Australia, I took my wife, and I made $5,000. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Oh, Benny Yurkides is a good friend of mine, Benny the Jet. And uh, by the way, you can ask him about pressure points. Benny the Jet has taught pressure point seminars now since he's been to my seminar and studying my DVDs. Then is a jet. If he says that you don't believe it, something's wrong with you. Wally J used to tell people, this is all for real. You don't believe him. You don't believe Leo Fong. 
Phil Fong will tell you right now, it's not only for real, he does it. I've changed the grandmasters the way they teach. And most of them will own up. There's a few teaching the pressure points, and they make like, oh, I got this from a secret man out of China. In fact, one of my own people did that, and I really raised hell about it. He went on our China trip and come back, and when he was teaching, people go, where'd you learn that? And he said, in China. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, that was me, you didn't. <laughs> but anyway, but the part that I uh, love about the martial arts is, like I said, I've been all over the world. I've traveled like you wouldn't believe. I did the Outback in Australia. I rattlesnake hunted all over Wyoming and Colorado and Arizona. I was taught, I've been to Indian reservations. I've had my moccasins online to show how worn they are. But I've been to Indian reservations and smoked peace pipes with the chief. I've been participated in Indian wrestling to get a little improvement of my art. And I had an old Indian medicine man, actually Blackfeet Indian tribe, show me how to do muscle manipulation. That I went, wow, that's actually the way it should be in the kata, and people don't realize that. It's all how you position your arm. If you if you put your arm down by your side like you're standing at attention, I don't care how you resist, I can pull it forward. But if you turn the back of your arm just a little bit, just not even three quarters, just turn the back of your arm in that same position towards your opponent, he can't move your arm because he's pulling against your muscle. Your muscle's on the outside of your arm. Your radial bone's up your arm. There's no muscle there. And so many people have their technique. I watch on the magazines, everything. I go, oh, my God, because it won't work. They're using the side of their arm that has no, there's not a muscle there. All you have to do is pivot your hand, just a touch. And they're pulling against their strong muscle. Does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. Yeah. Try it. Just get somebody. And and put your hands down by your side. It's in the kata. Kata Saison for sure, and some other Katas. You throw your hands down by your side, and everybody throws the bone, the big bone, right, aimed at his, their opponent. And then, first of all, I go, What are you doing with that? I'm blocking two kicks. When in your life do you think two people are going to kick at you from the sides that that block will do it? Right. So, that's all. Mm. You mentioned your block. website. Pardon? But I want to make sure you mentioned your website. I want to make sure that people know if they want to find your website, your books, your DVDs, that they've got all the options. Where would they go? Dillman.com. 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 Amazon.com. Type in George Dillman. Type in uh, very handsome martial artists. <laughs> oh, I don't come up under that. I'm sorry. Well, I don't know that anybody's done that list. Matt Brown, Matt Brown. Maybe, maybe if somebody does that list, I'm not doing that list because I'll put myself at the top. Mm. That doesn't that that doesn't feel right. It feels a little wouldn't we all? Yes. Well, hopefully, hopefully yeah. we all think think highly I, enough of ourselves. I use this as a joke. People who want to use this. Well, Michael Jackson was getting all of his plastic surgery, and. Blah, blah, blah. And I used to say, well, I, I had two plastic surgeries, and that's enough. And they go, have you had plastic surgery? I just go, you don't think people are born this good looking, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I just used it the other night, by the way, and it worked well. I like that one. First, it almost <laughs> fell out because I, I just brought it up out of a clear blue sky. I'd like to get a third plastic surgery. I had two and tighten up the skin or whatever. They come right in with it, fall right in. You had plastic surgery. 
And then I go, well, you don't think people are born this good looking, do you? That's it. That's, I joke around. I have a lot of humor when I teach seminars. But it's serious important. humor. It's serious humor. Right. right. So that's all. We did an hour and a half. Is that enough? We did. That's that's more than enough. I really appreciate your time. I mean, this has been great. Thank you. I hope you can use the whole hour and a half. I plan to. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's, I think you got a real good interview. I think so. Yeah. I just did we, a big we interview went... uh, with, with the magazine, with a book. They're writing a book about the friends of Muhammad Ali out of England. And there's 36 interviews, and I'm going to be one of them. If you knew anything about Professor Dillman prior to this episode, you were probably familiar with some of the controversy around him and what he teaches. As you heard in the episode, I didn't bring that up. That's not what we do on this show. We bring people on to speak to them, to hear their stories. And that's exactly what we did. I have the utmost respect for Professor Dillman and the fact that he brought up some of the controversy that he's involved in, and that he spoke so openly about it, because I suspect it needs to be said. My job here is not to judge or to decide what is true or not true. My job is to seek out and speak to martial artists all over the world, all disciplines, and hear their stories. And that's what we did. Thank you, Professor Dillman, for coming on the show, for giving of your time so generously. If you want to check out more about this show, you can head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This is episode 440. We provide transcripts and photos and a bunch more for all of our episodes. They're all available for free. And we thank you for your support. If you want to help us out, the best way is to head to whistlekick.com. Make a purchase. Use the code PODCAST15. That'll get you 15% off our protective equipment, uniforms, and a whole bunch more. You can also follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. If you want to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.